calling party, although this time it'll be an email party, to the White House at the end of the call, toward the end of the call. And I thank all of you who have been with us in the past, making these calls and sending these emails. It does make a difference when you exercise your voice. We know that. So I, I ask that you all stay with us until the end. Uh, it's, it's so important that we follow up what we are learning with an action. Uh, having said that, I just want to briefly introduce myself in case you're joining us for the first time. I'm Marcy Winograd. I'm the coordinator of Code Pink Congress and so proud to be working with fantastic women and men on so many different projects. Having said that, I'd like our other hosts to introduce themselves. So take it away, Hania. Well, uh, it's uh, great to see you all. And I, I see a message from Negar. Um, uh, uh, I I'm taking care of that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, my name is Hania Jodat Barnes. Um, it's an absolute honor to be here with you all. Um, I am a, a Bernie Sanders delegate to uh, from Congressional District 45, uh, president co-founder of Muslim Delegates and Allies, as well as the co-founder and national director of 50 State Voter Mobilization. One of the founding members of Women's March Los Angeles um, and uh, just your ally and, and, and uh, I've been partnering with Marcy for the longest time now. Six months feels like years uh, on, on working on policies that highlight the um, um, Muslim communities' um, uh, concerns, um, I would say, and uh, that impacts their community. So, honored to be here. Great to have you, Anya. Uh, Layla, you want to introduce yourself? Layla Zan? The Iranian American. Oh yes, <laughs> I'm muted myself. Hi everybody. I'm an, uh, I'm I'm Leila Zand. I'm uh, an Iranian American, a peace activist, and um, I've been in this field for a long time. And working with um, Code Pink um, recently in the past couple of years. Before that, I was with Fellowship of Reconciliation, and. Um, most of my work is concentrated on uh, diplomacy and particularly citizen diplomacy between Wonderful. Iran and the United States. Thank you. And I'd also like to introduce Ariel Gold, who's the national co-director of Code Pink and head of the U.S. Middle East project with Code Pink. So uh, go ahead. Say hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for this incredibly important discussion and to take action. I think now is a really exciting time as we have the possibility of um, somebody who's a real diplomat and a real Middle East expert uh, being appointed as U.S. envoy for Iran. Um, and it's, it's definitely a highly tense moment as the Hawks are trying to uh, keep Biden and Lincoln from giving him that appointment. And we'll talk later about the actions that Code Pink has to uh, support Rob Malley for uh, US Special Envoy to Iran. Yes, uh, our action alert tonight will be to write the White House and urge them to uh, reaffirm the Iran deal without delay, not to seek Senate approval, it's uh, urgent. Uh, there's going to be an election in Iran in several months, and it could be more difficult at that time. Uh, this is a very important peace agreement. So we want Biden to move ahead with it, and we want him to appoint Robert Malley as the special envoy, as Ariel mentioned, and to lift these sanctions crippling the economy in Iran. Marcy, your, your mic is really low. You need to turn up your volume. Yeah, I Speak louder. Can you hear me? I think when I, there are a certain number of people on the call, it gets harder. Is it all right now? Yes. We okay. can so I'll just project. Um, uh, all right. So at this point, why don't we go over the agenda? Honey, would, would you do that for us, please? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll go back up here. Um, and I do want to go, before we do that, I do want to ask everyone to please keep yourselves on mute. Um, we have had incidents where our speakers are speaking and we can hear you. And although we'd love to share in your um, activities on a day-to-day -day basis while you're on the call, we would love to be able to give the opportunity for everyone to uh, uh, be heard, um, our speakers. Um, so let me do this now, Marcy. Um, now, one of the other things I do ask, because we do have 185 people on this call, if you could use the participants button to raise your hands. Usually how we conduct these meetings is we our honorable speakers do speak and we ask you to put your questions in the chat 
this is a rather um, uh, sensitive subject for us to, to talk about. So we ask that you please share this space as um, uh, a place of allyship and uh, uh, respect our speakers as well as our audience members. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, thank you. And so let's go over the uh, agenda. Well, we uh, somewhat went over the updates um, and welcome. Um, and- uh, Another update, so we'll get back to that in a minute. Okay. Um, we do have Chada Parsi um, as well uh, as one of our uh, honorable speakers, as well as Negar Mortazavi, uh, uh, my fellow countryman and countrywoman. We are going to, after they speak, um, listen to uh, get into some Q&A, and uh, then we're going to uh, go right into White House Common Party, and we'll share some articles, podcasts of interest, and um, we will close out the evening with having accomplished something great. Thank you, Hania. I wanted to give a brief update about some of our activities. Some of you have been with us all along. We've been doing these Zooms, I think for a month and a half now. Uh, we didn't really get a chance, I don't believe, to debrief the Haynes confirmation. She, was, she is the Director of National Intelligence. She was confirmed by the Senate. There are only uh, 10 who opposed her. Most of them, all of them were Republicans actually. Uh, she, however, during her confirmation hearing at, in the committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, there were three things she said, which I thought were worth noting. First of all, she was asked uh, about China and the committee chairs are hawks. You know, it's uh, Marco Rubio and Mark Warner. And they basically said, China is, is an adversary, right? Right? And she said, well, China is an adversary on some things and uh, somebody, a country we have to cooperate on climate. We have to cooperate with on climate. And I thought that was a um, good, positive sign. She was also asked about torture. Uh, she said she will comply with the law. Yeah, uh, she, she did say, she was asked by Heinrich from New Mexico if she agreed with the committee's report that torture was ineffective, at which point she hemmed and hawed and said, well, there are better techniques. No one asked her one question about drones. And that of course is a big question mark. There's now a family from Yemen uh, who, that has filed a complaint in an international commission against the United States for its deadly drone strikes. And the latest reports that I read said that Biden has not commented on the role of drone warfare going forward. So we'll have to press him on that. Uh, we, last time we made some calls uh, to ask people, I believe, to sign on as co-sponsors for resolutions authored by Representative Meeks. And these would ban certain weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, certainly limit them. At that time, the resolutions that we were calling about had six or seven co-sponsors. I just looked, they now have 21. So that's a good sign. Um, today or yesterday, Biden signed an executive order limiting the Pentagon equipment that can be transferred to police departments under the 1033 program. Another good sign. Uh, he also has said today that he's going to restore aid to the Palestinians. Uh, before Trump revoked aid, they were receiving through a UN agency funded by the United States in large part, $368 million a year. So that's big news. And he has said that he wants to reestablish diplomatic missions with the Palestinian Authority. All right, I think that's enough for now. Uh, let's go forward with our program and introduce our first speaker. Um, it is my absolute honor to speak. Our first guest, uh, Trida Parsi, um, an award-winning author, scholar. He is the co-founder and executive vice president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, as well as the founder and former president of National Iranian American Council. Trista John, we welcome you. Please take it away. And uh, can we please uh, spotlight him, um, Mary? Thank you so much, Anya, and thank you all for participating and for Code Pig for organizing. Great pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, just a few words, um, uh, and then I'm gonna, I guess, give it to Negar to also speak. We are in a very interesting uh, situation right now. The Biden administration has clearly signaled its interest to go back into the nuclear deal. Uh, and the formula that it will be pursuing is called compliance for compliance, meaning that both the United States and Iran both, without preconditions, simply go back into the nuclear deal. And then whatever disagreements or things that they feel need to be 
uh, renegotiated, can be renegotiated, but once all sides are back into the deal, rather than seeking to do it from outside of the deal by using sanctions and other things that are violating the agreement in the manner that Trump tried to do. We've seen that there's some complications, obviously, in doing so. There's a bit of a uh, a diplomatic uh, fight right now over who needs to go first. I personally see that as uh, somewhat healthy signs, paradoxically. Uh, it means that they've reached a point in which there's not a disagreement on what needs to be done, but rather in what sequence, etc. We lived through this when the JCPOA happened, and I was quite impressed to see that the rather um, creative ways that both sides found to create mechanisms that allow them to say that they managed to get what they want when it came to sequencing. And I'm pretty confident that they will be able to do this this time around as well. The challenge, of course, is that on the one hand, there is a time pressure. You have the Iranian election, elections in June, but also towards the end of February, there's legislation in Iran that mandates the Rouhani government to start uh, enriching uranium at 20% if the U.S. hasn't lifted sanctions. So that creates a bit of a perhaps artificial pressure to move fast, but I'm not so sure that it really is needed. I think there's enough motivation on all sides to do this as quickly as possible. But as we have seen, there is no shortage of opposition from a few quarters. And I want to emphasize a few. The vast majority of countries wants to see this deal uh, reignited. They wanted to see it uh, be the basis of future negotiations. There are essentially only three places uh, in which this deal was controversial or uh, a, a opposition to it existed. It's in, in Israel, in Saudi Arabia, and the UAE, outside of the Republican Party, of course. Um, and we have seen clearly that the strategy of the other side is to fight tooth and nail every step, every even small fight. Uh, they seem to be going into it 110% to create an image in the minds of the Biden administration that it simply will require too much political capital from their end to go back into the deal. Uh, we, I think that the Rob Malley opposition that has been um, uh, mustered by them is, is part of that. I think they probably know that their chances of winning this one is not significant. It's not that great, but they seem to be willing to fight it nevertheless because they want, they want it to be a Pyrrhic victory for the Biden administration. Yes, they may be able to get Rob Malley through, but it's going to cost them so much that it's going to exhaust them and they're going to be even more careful when it comes to future appointments. Uh, moreover, we've seen quite clearly the signals from Israel. I mean, we have now ministers, cabinet ministers in the Netanyahu government that are publicly saying that if the United States goes back into the deal, the Israelis may have to take military action. So essentially telling the Biden administration, if you take a step towards peace and negotiations, we're going to take a step towards war. We're going to start a war. Um, and I think it tells you partly the desperation that exists over there because they know the direction that the Biden team is going to go. But also, I think uh, we've reached a point in which there is no respect whatsoever, it seems like, for the presidency of the United States. I mean, when it was clear that Biden had won the election, which was a couple of days after the election day this time around, most countries and most presidents and prime minister did everything they could to reach out to Biden, put themselves in the best positive footing with the new president of the United States. If they needed to build relations, they would do that. If they needed to rebuild relations, they would do that. Not the prime minister of Israel, however, because he ordered the assassination of an Iranian uh, nuclear scientist, which clearly was designed of creating a massive problem for the Biden administration and their idea of going back into the deal. So unlike previous cases in which the Israelis and the United States have ended up uh, having some tensions on various issues, those things were kind of built up in the climax. This time around, even before Biden took office, before he swore his oath, Bibi Netanyahu took off his, his gloves and started to throw the first punches. So uh, I think we can expect a, a very, very uh, uh, loud and, and bloody fight for the next couple of weeks when the me mechanics of getting back into the deal is worked out and, and the political fight here takes place. And that's why I think it's so important that Code Pink and all other organizations that are involved are as active, if not even more active now than they were in the summer of 2015 when we had a big congressional fight over the J, uh, JCPOA. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trida.
Um, this is Leila. I'm going to introduce, and it is my honor to introduce Negar. Um, Negar Murtazavi is an Iranian-American journalist and a political analyst covering Iran. She's the host of an Iran podcast. But before I go further, I want to take this uh, opportunity and thank Negar and say kudos to you, Negar John, because I follow Negar on Twitter and I see every day she gets a lot of um, um, actually attack from the um, warmongers and routinely uh, attack her um, political violence from there because of her stand for diplomacy. Negar has been uh, working as an um, as a uh, covering actually Iran uh, in both English and um, Persian, and um, has previously worked for the um, TV pres as a TV TV presenters for the Voice of America and worked with uh, International Center of Journalists, National Iranian American Council, the United Nation, and she has been a frequent commentator on Iran and many national and international. Um, outlets. Um, and uh, also, this, this was, I recently learned this, and it was really amazing to learn that Negar, The Guardian has named her as uh, one of the top, uh, top 10 people to follow on Twitter to, um, uh, for Iran issues, anything related to Iran. Um, here, we are very honored to have Negar. Negar John, please welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila, for that kind introduction to Hanya, Ariel, Medea is not here, and everyone else. Thank you for joining for your time tonight. And um, thanks for that message of sympathy, Leila John. I really need it. The attacks have really increased in the past four years. And recently, I just want to add that Trita is also one of the top targets. Uh, way before we were attacked, Medea is also one of the targets, and now Rob Malley has been added to the smear campaigns and the attacks that are constantly coming our way um, because we've been voicing, um, raising our voice against war and pro-diplomacy. Um, so just to add to Trita's comments, I want to also talk about uh, the dynamics inside Iran a little bit, because as, as Trita pointed out, uh, there are those very few countries and the Republican Party here, and then also the hardliners in Iran, or at least part of that hardliner camp who don't want this return to the JCPOA to happen so fast. Um, the presidential election that's coming up in Iran is actually a very critical election. It's the end of Rouhani's two-term uh, presidency of eight years, which is usually the turn of presidency in Iran. So in in June of, of this year, um, a new president will will enter in Iran, most likely for the next eight years. So this would be until the end of the Biden presidency. And what we see happening in Iran, even though right now it seems like the consensus in the um, state, and that includes the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, the top hardliner in Iran. The consensus is that Iran wants a return of the U.S. back to the JCPOA, and they're prepared to scale back, basically, their violations or their pushing of the limits of the JCPOA once the U.S. does this return. And the sequencing, as Trita said, is important. I can talk about that later. But part of the hardliners camp are also hoping um, to take the presidency come June and for them to be, or for that camp or the next president, that hardline, potentially hardline president, to be the one making this deal with the United States or um, an easing or lifting of sanctions. So there is some of that internal fight in Iran. Basically, part of that camp doesn't want the Rouhani government or the Zarif team to be the one taking the credit for um, for the lifting or easing of U.S. sanctions, because essentially the JCPOA or the Iran deal was the foreign policy legacy of the Rouhani presidency, the Zarif team, and it was a very popular um, deal when the negotiations were happening. Basically, Hassan Rouhani ran on the platform of, of resolving the issues with the West when he first ran in 2013, and then after he made the JCPOA or the nuclear deal with world powers in 2017, again, he ran on this platform that I'm the person who was successful. So in, in both times, he, as we know, we got the majority of the 
of the vote. So the, the majority of the population wants to come out of this very um, terrible economic situation, the crippling sanctions, the isolation, the political, economic, financial isolation of Iran and more of a um, or better ties and trade with the West. But there are certain camps inside the country who don't want this to happen. So sometimes we see alignments between the hardliners here in Washington and the hardliners part of the camp in Tehran that seems like um, they don't want the return to happen as fast at least. But I think time is of essence. As Trito was also saying, the sequencing of how they do it is important. It could be something similar to the JPOA before the JCPOA. Basically, what happened back in 2014-15 is the two sides first agreed on how they're going to do their process of Iran scaling back the program. And they announced that at the, as the interim agreement or the JPOA. And then a few months later, it was the actual JCPOA um, that took effect, and then that that was the lifting of U.S. sanctions as well. And we also have to remember that the lifting of sanctions is not going to be immediate, meaning the average Iranian is not going to see an economic benefit immediately. It's going to be a period of a few months by the time the Biden administration decides to ease or lift or however um, remove the Trump era sanctions. It's going to take a few months until that takes effect. And if that does happen fast before the election season starts in Iran, there could be a chance that the moderate camp could, which is very weak right now, by the way, um, that they could regroup and come up with a strong and popular candidate and win the presidency, which would be very important in, in Iran's basically political direction for the next eight years, if a moderate wins or if a hardliner um, takes effect. Right now, today, looking at Iran's political landscape, the overall political direction of the country is very hardline. There's also a lot of repression inside the country. Any form of dissent, of, um, of opposition to the government has been very violently repressed in the past few years under the Trump administration or the maximum pressure. Um, and and they, basically the human rights situation is actually pretty bad. So, and the overall political direction of the country has become very hard line. And if we look at it today, the moderates have the, uh, have, been, have become very weakened and the hardliners have the upper hand, but things can also change very quickly. Usually in Iranian presidential elections, you don't even know what's going to happen until the last week sometimes. Rouhani was very low in, in um, in the polls uh, in his, in, um, during his election until his very final live debate. So things could, go cha could change dramatically in Iran, especially if average Iranians see the economic benefit of, of this restarting of diplomacy. And then that could um, change the dynamics leading up to the presidential election. And if that doesn't happen, if the return doesn't happen fast or the diplomacy or if tensions increase, um, then we could possibly be basically gearing up for almost a decade of, of, of a hard line um, political direction in Iran. And as we all remember under President Ahmadinejad and how the, how the negotiations were going with the West. So I'll stop there, but I'm happy to answer any questions about Iran's political dynamics and also what's happening here in DC. And I just wanna add a note about the attacks on Rob Mali. It's just very interesting that it seems to be the same cycle, the same pattern, a lot of the same groups, although more high profile because obviously Rob is very high profile, but um, it's, it's the same similar smears used against him doctored video of his interview, things he didn't say or he didn't mean taken out of context and um, or somebody claiming that Iranian state media has endorsed him. They didn't. It was a reporting of who is supporting him, who is opposing him. So it's a lot of the same methods that um, that we see. And I think we will be seeing um, in the next uh, months or even years. Rob is probably not going to be the last one. OK, thank you. Do you want to? Yeah, we were actually both muted, but I just wanted to to uh, thank both Nagar and and 
Trita, for being here and, uh, you know, especially, especially having this very critical conversation with us. I do want to ask the first question, and we have so many incredible questions and comments listed in the, uh, in the chat, but for those of us who are uh, not, not familiar with the history of the sanctions on Iran, can one of you briefly tell us a little bit about um, what sanctions really mean on the economy as well as when they actually started on the Iranian, uh, the, you know, in Iran, dating back to perhaps the 70s? Can you touch upon that, either one of you? Negar, you want to go first? You go and then I'll go after. Okay. Um, yeah, so Iran has been under an increasing amount of sanctions since the 1980s when the revolution happened and you know the Iranians took um, 52 American diplomats hostage and we had a hostage crisis. But it's not until 1994 when you start to see a much more broad-based sanctions, uh, two executive orders by Bill Clinton in 1994-95 essentially eliminated $4 billion of trade, which was just food material and things of that nature uh, between the countries, mostly the Iranians importing it, uh, um, uh, buying American uh, products. Um, since then, we have seen a, a, a gradual increase of the sanctions. And then by the mid-19, late 19, 1990s, the sanctions started to become extraterritorial. That's when the United States started to sanction other countries if they traded with Iran. And then under Bush and then under Obama, it got worse and worse. Uh, and by the time the nuclear deal started at a very serious level, the sanctions that were on Iran were probably made Iran probably the most sanctioned country that the United States was sanctioning at the time. And many of us thought that that was as far as the U.S. literally could go. And then Trump showed up and uh, essentially led the Foundation for Defense of Democracy um, uh, write uh, the U.S.'s policies on these issues, and we saw even more sanctions being imposed. Part of the reason why Trump could go much further is because Trump literally did not care about the consequences, not on the Iranian people, but on U.S. allies and, and the U.S.'s own standing. So uh, he had no concern. It was essentially an obsession with Iran that drilled the sanctions policy to a very, very bad degree. And the impact on the Iranian people has been obviously devastating, particularly mindful of the fact that you have so much corruption in Iran and so much economic mismanagement. In fact, if the Iranian economy was much better managed and had so much uh, less corruption to begin with, the sanctions pain would have become much less because sanctions actually tend to be more impactful when you already have a sick economy and a corrupt economy as the Iranians unfortunately do. Uh, one thing I'll say before I hand it over to, to uh, Negar on this, which I think is very important, is that in the past, sanctions were oftentimes seen by Democrats as an alternative to war. Increasingly, uh, it is clear now that sanctions are starting to be seen as an alternative way of war. It is not an alternative to war. It is a form of warfare. And you now have for the first time through legislation by Chris Murphy, by legislation by Ilan Omar, uh, measures that seem to also be having some uh, pickup in the administration to make sure that whenever the United States sanctions another country, there should be continuous assessments by the US government of what the humanitarian impact of those sanctions have been. That is not the end of it in my view, but it's a very important step to make sure that that is actually measured by the US government itself. Another measure that would be also good is to see what is the impact of those sanctions on the American economy, because that's something that the US government doesn't even look at. It has no idea what the cost of these sanctions have been on American workers here at home. And if those start, things started to actually be part of the picture, I think we will have a much healthier attitude towards sanctions and much more skeptical attitude towards the very excessive use of sanctions that we've seen in the last couple of decades. Um, I just want to explain that, uh, first of all, the Iranian population is very young, almost 70% of the population, because my generation, I was born in the early 80s, my generation was a baby boomer in Iran, so about 70% of the population is under the age of 40. And basically, the majority of Iranians don't remember life without sanctions. That's how long sanctions have been 
imposed on Iran. But as Trito is saying, they've gradually increased. And now they essentially under the pandemic are the definition of crippling. I had this piece a few months ago um, published for the foreign policy, which I did research for how Iranian healthcare workers, particularly nurses who are mostly women, are suffering a higher rate of death of the pandemic when you compare it to, for example, Italy or even China, um, because of a lack of protective, uh, personal protective equipment, which is something that sanctions have contributed to the shortage to, um, because it's not only uh, drugs, it's, it's specifically medical devices. And it's, it's, it's a lot of this trade that on paper, there's supposed to be exemptions for, for humanitarian items, for, um, for drugs and food, but in reality, the, the exemptions in the law or on paper are not efficient and Iran hasn't been able to get enough of these medical devices that they need under the pandemic. Even NGOs, international NGOs, um, European NGOs have trouble paying their staff on the ground in Iran. These are staff that work with Afghan refugees um, people fleeing war who take refuge in Iran, for example, ref, um, staff that work um, with, with nurses and healthcare workers under the pandemic. They have trouble getting material in, paying their own staff on the ground. And we even at the beginning of the pandemic, Iran had trouble getting test kits of, um, of COVID into the country as a, as a uh, limitation placed on by sanctions and then the World Health Organization had to step in some of the neighbors the UAE and and some others had to step in and help so it's been very very devastating and cruel I would say and we've seen a lot of calls international calls by the UN Secretary General by the Human Rights Commissioner um, and many Democrats here in the country in the US asking for the Trump administration as one New York Times editorial put it, to have mercy under the pandemic, but we didn't see any easy, easing of the sanctions. So I think what's important for the Biden team, and it could be a, a one first step um, goodwill gesture is to, um, to lift some of these sanctions or make sure that exemptions are carved in a way that can open the door for anything related to COVID, be it medical uh, devices, be it, uh, the vaccine or Iran's request for a loan from IMF, which as a member they're entitled to. The Iranians haven't requested for an emergency loan since uh, the 1960s. And for the first time, they requested a $5 billion emergency loan from the IMF that the Trump administration basically blocked. And um, there, there could be mechanisms for that so that the money doesn't get into the country as cash and add to all the corruption that Trita was saying. It could be uh, put into INSTEX, the European financial mechanism, that then the Europeans will have full control over how it's being spent, but it could really help the country, which is suffering both from the pandemic as the epicenter of the pandemic in the Middle East, and also from this um, economic hardship that's combined um, mm -hmm. with the pandemic. Thank you, Nagar. Um, the next two questions, I'll, I'll, I'll put them together, um, is uh, one is from James. Um, what is the significance of the 20% enrichment? And then I know, Trida, you touched upon that at the very beginning of your, uh, your dialogue with us. Can you talk about that possibly and tell us why that is so significant? Negar, you wanna go first? No, you go. <laughs> okay. 20% um, is significant for two uh, main reasons. First of all, the JCPOA explicitly limits Iran's enrichment to 3.65%. So it would be in violation of one of the very central tenets of the JCPOA. Now, the Iranians make the argument that because the U.S. has left and breached the agreement, Iran can use Article 36 to reduce its own commitments. But nevertheless, uh, there's been other things, you know, they've built another underground uh, facility. That's not a violation of the JCPOA. They're allowed to do that. 20% would be a violation. And part of the, the second part of the reason why 20% is important is because if you start enriching uranium at 20% uh, and you start creating 20% enriched uranium and then you reprocess that and you bring it up above 90%, then you have managed to get weapons grade uranium. 
uh, whereas at 3.67%, it's still far away from that degree of enrichment that is required for a bomb, but you can still use it for fuel for uh, a, a nuclear um, uh, plant. So uh, the higher you go up with the enrichment, the closer you get to weapons grade. And that's part of the reason why the JCPOA specifically made sure that the Iranians would not go above 3.67. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, I don't have anything to add to this. I just forgot something to mention from the previous one. And I think this is very important is that sanctions actually do add to the high level of corruption that exists in Iran. It helps create an ecosystem that's not transparent. There's a lot of middlemen and a lot of shady dealings, which the state has to get involved to, to be able to sell oil and other products and get uh, commodities into the country so it's the corrupt the most corrupt of the corrupt of of the political class or even elite outside the political class who are benefiting in fact from these economic sanctions and it's average Iranians the working class the middle class um, who are who have been suffering economic sanctions I've done an interview with actually a, a leading sanctions expert Erica Moret who is a researcher in Europe and she used to be a British diplomat. I'll post the link in the chat. If you have time, take a listen. It's a podcast, it's a half hour audio, but it's very um, enlightening on, on how sanctions can be efficient as a, effective as a foreign policy tool if they're targeted, if they have a very specific goal and if they're combined with diplomacy and how sanctions are ineffective and have these humanitarian impacts if they're just broad and you know, piled on just for the sake of sanctions for more sanctions. Um, the next question is very interesting. It's, uh, I'll pose it to both uh, Negar and Trida. Um, two part question. Does Iran even want nuclear weapon? I, I had heard that Iran wants nuclear energy because they see the end of oil. Is that in fact their policy? I'm not for nuclear energy, but I think if folks knew it right, it may help. So thank you, Nina, for that question. Negar, you have to take this one first. It's going to look bad if I go first every time. Okay, no problem. Um, well, to be honest, I mean, reports are contradicting, but Iran did have, as far as the international um, watchdogs say, had a nuclear weapons program, or at least ambitions to move into that direction. This goes back to um, there's also a lot of history involved, but goes back to the Iran Iraq war era of the 1980s and um, the time when Iran felt like they were alone and vulnerable and Saddam was supported by most um, powers in the region and also beyond including in Europe and the US and but that has stopped that um, what the ambitions or the weapons program has stopped and Iran has now uh, agreed to the most intrusive sanctions um, inspections um, regime of, of, a, of a nuclear program and so far has abided by the deal. Inspectors still go in, they're pushing the limits, but it's nowhere close to a weapons, an actual weapons program. There's also a fatwa, a religious order by the Supreme Leader. Um, I mean, fatwas can also always change. So it's, um, but, but so far right now, as far as the leadership and the, the religious um, direction of the country and also the po politics of it, it seems like the calculation of the state is that um, they want to have nuclear, um, civilian, a civilian nuclear program is actually a source of a lot of pride for a part of the population. They want to have the research, the material, and, um, but they don't want to, the right now the calculations, they don't want to go down the path of an actual weapons program. Thank you, Nagarjan. I see a couple of hands up here. I do ask that if I do unmute that you please keep your questions to 30 seconds or less. Um, and if you have any comments, please do uh, ask in 30 seconds. Uh, we'll go to Sudi, please unmute yourself. Hi, thank you for, uh, very much for uh, being here. I have two specific uh, questions. Uh, if, although the Muslim ban was uh, lifted, the issue that arose at the end of Obama's uh, uh, 
uh, term with the HR 158 is still in place, meaning that the visa waiver is not applicable uh, to um, anyone who has traveled to Iran and six other countries in the past five years or are not citizens and they're from that country. If you can uh, address what uh, Nayak has done or if you have any insight into that. And the number two is that Biden has, uh, uh, you know, insisted on the, on the fact that he will be, um, you know, lifting the country quota regarding green cards and H-1B visas, which could be very disastrous for any country other than China and India. And uh, again, if you could uh, add any insight to that, or if Nayak has done anything in regards to that. So uh, I don't have a formal role with Nayak any longer. Uh, it's been that way for two years. So I, I frankly don't know, but I would be quite certain that Nayak is on the ball on this one, at least with HR 185. Um, um, which of course was overtaken by the Muslim ban. Once the Muslim ban was in place, that uh, it became irrelevant. Now it's become relevant again because even though the ban is taken away, um, the, the the visa requirements uh, still remain in place. Uh, and I, um, and I'm pretty confident that that might be something that uh, Nayak will take a look like to take a look at and undo. When it comes to the other measure that you mentioned, I know Nayak was very active on it, but I don't have the details on it. I don't know if Negar does, uh, uh, but you should contact Sina Tusi, Ryan, um, or, or Jamal at Nayak. I'm sure they can provide you with that information. I'm also not very up to date. Uh, as like Trita said, they've been fighting um, the, the various issues, but uh, Donna Farad is also one of the people who's been working on these. I also want to add a note that it's not just the visa, visa issues or the travel ban. We've seen more severe cases as a, as a result of the increased tensions or basically the military conflict back in January when Qasem Soleimani was assassinated um, with Trump's order, we saw Iranian Americans, American born children sometimes being detained at US borders coming back into the country, sometimes for hours, overnight some in the Canadian border. We saw Iranian students with visas in hand. These are people who go through security clearances for months and months, multiple agencies. They have valid visas in hand. They came here, they were detained some for up to 48 hours overnight without food, very intrusive questions about their, their political views, what they thought about the assassination of Qasem Soleimani and then being sent back or deported with those valid visas. And these are all direct basically um, results of the increased military tension. And then later we also found out as another um, you know, chapter in the Trump administration that there was an, in fact a directive from the CDP telling border agents to detain not only Iranians, but Iranians, Lebanese, Palestinians, and Shias, people of the Shia um, faith of Islam at the border and ask them these questions. Um, there was this one Iranian student, a woman who was asked where Iran hides, um, I don't know, military equipment in ships. And her answer was that I've been studying. I don't know, I don't read the news and I don't follow these issues. So military tensions, even if war doesn't start when there's military tension, um, it's ordinary citizens back in Iran, it's Iranian Americans here, people coming through the border, students, and then also the Ukrainian flight um, a few days after that um, 176 civilians were killed on board. It's the civilians who will pay the price um, for, for military tensions, basically. Thank you. I see Alina's hand up. Alina, if you could please unmute yourself. Hey, uh, thank you so much. I, I wanted to understand this concept where when Trump wanted to use military force against Iran and uh, the whole, you know, the joint, the G, I want to make sure I pronounce it right. That it's the sanctions, right? The way they made a big deal about it, they jumped on it, they put restrictions on Trump, but why is it that they're supporting Biden's campaign when it comes to Iran? Using the same type of tactics, the same military use, the same sort of abuse of sanctions, but they're okay with that. Is there any way we can mobilize against that before they even decide to support it? Uh, 
I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. Could you could you repeat? Okay. Um, I was saying that uh, there is a trend, right, during the Trump administration, where every time Trump wanted to use military or some sort of force of abuse, right, what happened was that the Democrats, they jumped right on and restricted him from all sorts of powers. But now that Biden campaign has taken over the White House, I'm assuming that he's going to probably use the same sanctions that Clinton had used, the same sanctions that Bush had used, and basically the same sanctions that Trump tried to use, but couldn't because Democrats, they wanted to vilify him. But I'm wondering, is there a way we can mobilize before they even take any actions? Yes, there certainly are. I, I would say though that, um, unfortunately, sanctions are gonna continue to be used. But as I mentioned uh, in one of the earlier, answers that there are other measures that are being taken right now to make it more difficult. But I also think that uh, some of the things Code Pink and others have worked for may actually come true rather soon, particularly in, in the case of Yemen, for instance. So I think there's uh, good reasons to believe that some good things will happen as well. And I think it's equally important to make sure that we try to support those things and make sure that they are not reversed because there will be forces, very powerful forces that will try to prevent the Biden administration to go in the right direction on some of these issues. Nigar Chen, did you wanna to add to that also or should we move on to the next question? Um, no, we can take the next question. I'm also trying to read the questions, see if I can address them. Uh, let's go to Myla. You've had your hand up since the beginning, so. There, I've unmuted. Um, first, just a, a comment and a reminder. Um, everyone, this is the, there's so much extra excellent com, um, content in the chat. I want to remind everybody to save the chat by going to the bottom. And if you need help with that, um, that's another question. But I just posted um, just for the purpose of retweeting, um, Ariel Gold and Trita Parsi and Sarah Margon have all tweeted about what we're discussing here at this meeting. And, um, and just to follow Nagar, uh, because uh, I, I don't have a, a, anything to retweet, but I just posted. So if you want to go ahead and retweet. Now I have a question. And um, what I'm wondering about, because um, I've been very active in the uh, no nukes movement and in moving towards a, a sustainable clean energy. And I understand that uh, Iran's in a terrible position because without developing nuclear, they're more um, vulnerable to attacks. So from a military perspective, it's sort of a requirement, but they're poisoning their environment and content and creating other problems, environmental problems, by virtue of having nuclear power. So um, it, can either of you or anyone here answer if there is a, um, a clean energy movement, a safe energy movement in Iran, and a movement uh, against nuclear power because of the environmental consequences? Thank you. Nigar, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so I, I've also posted one tweet that this is going back to some of the smears about Rob Malley that I mentioned and feel free to follow if you want, as the Guardian says. Um, as far as the nuclear program, it's, uh, it's a very, it's a matter of national security and also very securitized and, and sensitive. So it's not something unfortunately, like here that that a lot of citizens can speak up against. Although I can say the part that the nuclear program has caused, caused all the tension with the US with with Europe and Iran's neighbors, there's a lot of resistance to that in a in a considerable part of the population, I wouldn't say the majority because we don't have polls, polls are these, these type of opinion polls and political polls are also very sensitive in Iran, not everyone can conduct them. Um, there's some polls uh, done by the University of Maryland. So just to go short, as far as a very strong and robust movement, no, there isn't. Um, but there's a strong environmental movement in general. So against the uh, 
um, a lot of pollution, the water quality, the air quality, the uh, desertification, the rivers, the lakes, a lot of issues in which is not just also about Iran, but in, in the whole region people are grappling with and, and there's a robust environmental movement. And right now, as we speak, there are also some environmental activists in prison, including one American. So um, but I guess it could eventually become a part of that, but it isn't a, a big movement right now. Thank you, Nagar. Um, I'll ask, uh, I, I, I see Gigi, I, I, is it Goldstein? Yes, uh, Gary Goldstein, Gary, yes. Gary. Go ahead uh, and ask the question. Uh, I just uh, wanted to make a comment about the 20% uh, enrichment that is far from 90%. Uh, and part of uh, the agreement, if we ever get back to it, is very severe uh, inspection regime that had been going on and, and still is going on in spite of the US not being part of the, the agreement, which essentially keeps track of the rate at which enrichment goes on. It depends on numbers of centrifuges and the rate at which they process the material. And so it's uh, the experts can tell you how many many months or years it will take to actually get to 90% if that is what is desired. And it isn't clear that's desired. I think the 20% right now is more a symbol of uh, what could happen if the US doesn't join the agreement again. I don't consider it a step towards uh, building weapons at all. Thank you, Gary. Um, our next question would be Mahnaz, and then we go to Vincent, and then I will hand it off. Um, well, we have another one from uh, Rana as well, um, and then we'll hand it off to Marcy for our call to action. Uh, so Mahnaz, if you can unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Thank you for the whole presentation. Uh, hi, Trita. Um, I, um, my question goes to Secretary Austin that was just, um, um, approved by uh, the Senate. Uh, he has been a warrior. He's only two or three years away from having been um, a general in the field. And he's pretty hawkish on Iran. So how would that work? Um, Trita, more than likely this goes to you. How would that, how would his standing in the way that he sees Iran as a threat to US allies, I'm coding him on that, um, in the region, how would that affect the diplomatic approach that Biden might want to take on, um, on Iran? Thank you. Thank you so much, Mahnaz, so much, Mahnaz. It's been great to hear your voice again. Um, there's not much that has been known about Austin, to be completely frank. He's kept his cards very tight um, and does not have much of a public profile on his positions. What some of my colleagues at Quincy have been able to find out because of their connections at, uh, at the Pentagon is that, uh, yeah, I, I don't think he has a particular soft spot for the government in Iran, but he was strongly against the war in Yemen, was infuriated when the Saudis started it and was very much upset that the US went along with it and does not seem to believe that the United States uh, has a good reason to keep uh, this large number of American troops in the region. Um, and I think that would be a very important and fresh perspective coming to the Pentagon that can have a very positive impact on diplomacy with Iran as well, because at the end of the day, um, it is one thing when you have some of these folks in the military or elsewhere in the government who confuse the U.S.'s own national interests with that of Saudi Arabia and believe that it is the task of the United States to do the Saudis' bidding. Uh, it doesn't seem like that he in any way, shape, or form falls in that category. And I think that can have very positive uh, repercussions for uh, U.S. foreign policy in the region as a whole, including diplomacy with Iran. Thank you. Any more 
questions? Your mic is off, we cannot hear you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Vincent, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, uh, since the principal ruling authority in Iran is the Ayatollahs, with respect of their being a president, I know in the 90s, Ali Khamenei issued a fatwa against the development, acquisition, or use of nuclear weapons, principally based on the Iran-Iraq war and the horrible bloodshed and carnage that occurred there. The use of chemical weapons, which simply came from the United States. I am curious what the current feeling of the Ayatollahs as a group, or singularly, is on the acquisition of nuclear weapons. Um, I explained it, but I'll just recap. The fatwa still exists. Khamenei is still the supreme leader, so he's the ultimate religious and political authority. And we see the same political line also from down the, the political ranks that Iran is not after a nuclear weapons program. So I assume this is going to be the case for probably until Khamenei is is still supreme leader and alive and possibly even beyond that. I don't see the calculation changing unless there's a nuclear arms race across the region. We've seen Saudi Arabia and the UAE starting some talks of that. And there's always the elephant in the room, which is the Israeli um, program that uh, changes the calculations. And then there's also some in Iran's neighborhood like Pakistan um, who were able to acquire. So that's actually the Pakistan route is something that uh, at some point at the beginning of the program, um, some Iranians in that um, in, in the decision making had that in mind. But I don't think that that is the direction that Iran is trying to go right now. I think um, they uh, the calculation is that they will they don't want to go down the, the weapons path. And Trita, did you want to also add to that or? No, I think what um, I agree with what Nagar said. Beautiful. So thank you so much to our speakers, our honorable speakers. Um, I know there are a ton of questions uh, coming up, but we're very short on time. And uh, I do want to, um, again, uh, uh, send my, my regards and thank you to both uh, Trita and Nagar for being here, sharing their wisdom with us and participating in this most critical conversation uh, and shedding the light on what's happening currently um, in Iran uh, as it relates to the sanctions and so on. Um, I do want to ask Marcy to please hop back home. On. I don't see you, Marcy. So you can. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thank, well, thank you. You know, thank I'm you. Fascinated listening to the two of you, and I learned so much. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> I learned so much from what you said, and and I hope that you'll come back and that we'll have more to talk about because we will have rejoined the Iran deal by then. Hopefully. Yeah. Thank hopefully. you. I had no idea about this February, was it February 5th, the deadline when Iran's going to start producing more uh, or enriching more uranium? Is that it? I think it's 23rd. Oh, 23rd, all right. Well, in February, yeah. Uh, I'm getting mixed up with the START Treaty, which expires, I think, February 5th with Russia. Anyway, um, <clears throat> you know, I think tonight our goal is to send a message to the White House that we really want them to rejoin this deal and not wait for the Senate. It was so clear to me watching some of these confirmation hearings with the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that the chairs of these committees are so out of touch with the American public, so hawkish, you know, just salivating for a military confrontation. And I think Biden is smart enough to know, as Obama knew, that there's no point in going to the Senate to approve this deal. The Senate will not approve this deal. A divided Senate like this, I doubt it. So our message to the White House is to go ahead, ASAP, rejoin this deal, appoint Robert Malley, who was the lead negotiator on the 2015 Iran nuclear deal as the US special envoy and lift these crippling sanctions, my goodness, right? During a pandemic even. So uh, if, if Mary, if you can repost that script in the chat, that would be fantastic. Uh, what usually we call, we make calls, but I have to say that I called the White House today and you cannot leave a comment yet on the comments line. 
And when you call the switchboard, it says press whatever to leave a comment. And then that takes you back to the, <laughs> to the message that says you can't leave the comment, but you can write to the White House. So that's what I am asking. We're asking people who are on the line with us still, how many do we have still? Let's see, 172. Let's all send those emails into the White House. Tonight, I, there is the action alert and uh, I, let's do it. And please post in the chat when you've sent your email. And I ask that you also, after doing this, see if you can get three or four friends to do it as well. And to post this action alert on your Facebook page, whatever social media platform you have, whatever emails you use, uh, let others know. Let's, let's send a lot of messages in because we know the pushback the other way is very intense right now. Hi, this is Arielle, and I wanted to see if, Mary, if you could also post in the chat, um, we have a, a one-click uh, way to send that message, if you prefer that, if that's easier for you, um, and if you can share that uh, with your friends and colleagues and ask them to do that as well. Actually, if we can do both. That would we be absolutely do both. Yeah, we'll get this up. Marcy, it's Ruth. Um, definitely put it in the chat because it just vanished from my screen and you couldn't uh, copy and paste it either. That's right. That's because Mary is uh, working on putting this other link into the chat. So if you can just bear with us for a minute, uh, you can also just Google okay. uh, contact the White House. There you go. Okay. So there you have the email address. If you copy that and put that in your URL or click on it, you should be able to start writing your email. And I do want to add one thing. There is po there's power in numbers. So I see uh, we went from 170 to 161 now. But I'm asking for everyone to please stay and join this, uh, join in in this call to action because it's extremely critical and important. So um, we do want to stay for that. Well, I've got my phone and I am emailing right now. Yes. And if you've already taken this action, if you've already sent your email, but you're still on the line, we would also encourage you to sign. We have a petition going to support Robert Malley, and you can find that at codepink.org slash Malley, or right at the top of the page at codepink.org. And I see Mary just put it in the chat. We are less than 150 signatures away from our, our initial goal of 5,000. So if you haven't yet signed the petition in support of Mali, please do so now and share it with your friends and on your social media. The email address that you have there is not an email, it is a website. You have to click on it. It's a website. Yeah, they don't give out an email per se, but if you go to that website, it's a contact page where you can send an email. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure. And can you put it in the chat? Because I can't copy it from here. I can uh, read it off to you. Oh, I can see it. Um, I did a screenshot, so hopefully I can grab it. I just need to be able to see it a little longer so that I can call. You can also just Google, contact the White House, and, and that should take you there as well. Yeah, thank you. There you go, Jean. I put it in the um, in the chat. It should be uh, show up as a link now. Great, thank you. Yeah, if you scroll up back to the comments, you should see it. Thanks. I'm surprised the White House doesn't have its comment line up yet. Yep. 
I'm not. The voice of cynicism, or perhaps realism. <laughs> well, the, the 60, you know, Biden really supporting keeping the, the, uh, the, the 60 majority thing. I mean, come on, he, he could have put pressure on, on, on those Democrats and had some real power. The corporatists have control and that's the reality. I'm sorry, I won't start. I agree. <sighs> right. Well, that's the decision the Democratic Party made. I wasn't a Biden supporter either. What happened was South Carolina stepped in mainly, uh, and frankly, it was a very conservative Democratic co coalition in South Carolina that just said, no, we are not going to have a woman. We're not going to have a person of color. We're not going to have a progressive. We're going to have an establishment white man. That's what we're going to do. And what makes it all the more shocking is that the coalition that saw to it that that happened in South Carolina was led by a contention of African-American leaders inside South Carolina. It was truly, truly shocking. I was truly well, I, shocked. Uh, yes, and I just want to make sure everybody's uh, sending their emails. Thank you. I, I agree. I was very disappointed and I worked hard for Bernie. I will say this. It's great that Bernie is going to be chairing the budget committee. Right. He through the process of reconciliation a lot. He can reverse some of these uh, tax cuts, uh, the tax cuts for the rich. Uh, he can, you know, include a lot of stimulus money in that. And you know, I have to say, Biden's executive orders so far, I think, have been ter terrific. You know, uh, great. Great. I mean, beyond anything I anticipated. I was reading an article today that enumerated, you know, over a dozen of his executive orders. And, and so we just, you have to push on the foreign policy because right now there's yes. um, a gap there. Yeah. My liberal friends think pushing means that you're not uh, for unity. The media has sold that so completely. Oh, they're so naive. That's amazing. It's amazing. Educated, think they're I'm, I, so discouraging. I, I may lose three friends over all of this. Well, those three friends were never meant to be yours, Mara. Thanks. <laughs> but, but, but the question to me is, how do we become more persuasive for people like that? Me too. That's my question. So anyone who has answers. Um... I, I would just say that you're doing your uh, patriotic duty by letting the elected know how you feel. How are they supposed to know how people feel if you don't express your opinion? That's democracy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the public square. Are they saying that there should be no participation? They're afraid that they're- But you're, but you're afraid with you, for your friend, maybe you can ask them more questions than telling them what it is because they have turned, heard about other friends that what it is, some of them lies, but ask them more questions. What do you think about this? What do you do? And then you, in your responses or in one comment, open, you know, they really stop and think because some of the things that I've never thought about. Well, what I've heard pretty consistently with this group is that to, that to start pushing like a, I, w I wanted, you know, one of uh, the uh, Biden's, um, you know, nominations, the guy mm -hmm. who's, who has the history um, with the chemical companies. And they felt that it would be unsupportive to sign that saying, try to resist his, uh, appointment because we should just give Biden some time, six months or so to do what he thinks is best. And uh, um, Mara, Mara, they don't they don't know Biden's history. Not Perhaps not. if you as yeah. that's else, a good idea. I could give them that. I could yeah. give them that. that's a good they idea. Have to know more. As as but, me, I said they need to know more. And the way to do that I think is the questions. Yeah. Right. Right. And also Biden has appointed people that for whatever reason, some of them connections, some of them Obama and all of that, but it's our job and responsibility to put pressure on them consistently on all the issues. Absolutely. We are concerned about the issues, not the relationship that these people have or what they, how they came to, the, to be in position that they are. Our responsibility, the public's responsibility to stick to the constitution 
and just press them. And, and then oh, so in, um, do we still need to keep this up? Have most of you sent your email? Yeah, um, I have a question about Ariel. Okay, maybe uh, you can mute yourself just one at a time. Uh, Milo, what did you want? Well, I, I was just trying to send this um, letter that Code Pink makes so easy to send. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it has you edit the, the, their proposed letter before you send it. And at the end, it says, sincerely, and then it says your name. And I'm wondering whether we actually have to change it to our name or whether that's automatic because our name is up in the, you know. I don't know. You just put your name. Ariel or Mary, do we know if it's coded already through the... Oh, the you're talking about the petition. Oh, I thought you were talking about the other. No, I'm talking about the... Um, signature. I, had, I had linked to um, Ariel's link about um, taking action on Rob Malley. Um, did, did you see that? Uh, I, I hope everybody... Because I hadn't yet um, taken action myself to sign the petition. The and question then, is whether we can fill in our name. I wasn't whether we're, whether we're supposed to change it or whether no. that's automatically changed to our name. I don't I believe. Sorry, I believe it is automatically filled in. I hope so. 29 minutes ago. There, there is a list. There is a list of names that have signed that's immediately updated. So yeah. I don't think you need to actually edit the letter. Where is the petition? Let me, I'm, I'm going to send you the link right now. Maybe we should. On the top of the page, of course. Why don't we take this down? Yeah. May I interrupt for a moment? If you do have a comment to make, it is, I, we would ask that you please raise your hand so that we're not talking over each other. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so here's my, my ask. And that is that all of us, there are now 94 of us. That's great. Take what we wrote, take the action and post it on a social media platform or share it with some friends in an email. See if we can, you know, double or triple our efforts right now. And here's some good news. Raytheon fears Biden will cancel $500 million in arms sale to Saudi Arabia. So uh, we should probably also let them know to do that. Great. Yeah. I think it's really, you know, I think we have to remind ourselves that our voices are critical because a lot of people are not paying attention here. Mm -hmm. We are paying attention and they know it. Um, and kind of to echo what Manager John was uh, saying earlier is that representation matters 100%. Um, it's very important to educate, but I would also encourage our Iranian, Yemeni, um, uh, people from Libya who are, who are raising their children here to encourage their children just as much as they do to get in medicine and, and, and law, to get in politics and learn their rights, right? And so we can, we can have, it, have room at the table to discuss you know, certain policies that impact us. So um, that's the most important, at least you know, in my opinion, so. And I want to encourage you, if you are on Twitter, please follow me. I'll follow you back. And we can retweet each other and amplify our voices that way, too. And if you know anyone in Arizona. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mercy, go ahead. I'm handing this up to you. Well, I think we probably are all aware now that uh, two Democrats have said they will refuse to vote to end the filibuster, right? That's yes. uh, Bill Manchin in West Virginia ah. and uh, Kristen Sinema in Arizona. Uh -huh. So, uh, I mean, I'm gonna be, right when I get off this call, I'm gonna contact my friend who runs a PAC and say, hey, can we start raising money for a primary challenge to Kristen Cinema and Joe Manchin too, why not? Uh, because they need to feel the heat, right? I mean, this is, I said to them in a tweet, what will your legacy be? Your legacy will be racism because the filibuster grew out of the Jim Crow era. It was to preserve, as she says, minority rights. No, white rights, right? Mm -hmm. So we've got to find somebody to primary these people and start raising money and give them, give them hell. Come on. So many people, they're stomping on so many people by saying this, by refusing. What's your, what's your Twitter account, by the way? You were just mentioning something about Twitter. What's your Twitter account? Oh, it's right Sorry, here. Sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to include you. 
M A R C Y W I N O G R A D. I'm sorry, can you post it up or something so we can type it? Oh, I just put it in the chat. It's M A R C Y Winograd W I N O G R A D. Twitter can Marcy, be a powerful tool. Marcy Winograd? Marcy Winograd? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, and I'll follow you back. All right, so it's 618. I think we're good. Yes. I was going to show a video, but I'll save it for next time. Next time, we're going to be talking about Russia, the START Treaty. It expires February 5th. So if you have an extra minute, send another email to Joe Biden and say, get on this. It's going to run out. This is essential. You've got to re, you know, re up on the START Treaty. And uh, Victoria Newland, who was his pick for number three in the State Department, said publicly she wants just a one year extension. Biden has said he wants a five year extension. Why doesn't he want an eight year extension? He's going, you know. So uh, I, that will be my message to him. It should be an eight year extension. Uh, and uh, Victoria Newland, if you're on Twitter or Facebook, check out Code Pink. We've got a video. Uh, of her. Mary, can we play the video? It's short. Sorry, is that the Victoria Newland video yes. that Michelle okay. made? Hang on. Here we go. This, this has gotten uh, over 10,000 views on Twitter. You will be entertained. Yeah. <sighs> um, it's based the, while she's working on this, uh, this video was based on an actual conversation, some of you are aware of, I'm sure, that Newland had with the ambassador to Ukraine from the United States. This was in 2014, in which she said explicitly she wanted us to install her person, our the US puppet. Uh, and uh, take advantage of any kind of division within Ukraine uh, and to uh, meet that, that the puppet we were going to install should be meeting with the leader of the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists oh. four times a week. And she even met with them and has a picture smiling with them. Uh, so I, you know, I, for the life of me, I don't know why Biden wants her in the State Department, uh, but the pressure has to be on, rejoin this, re-up, give us an extension of eight years. I don't know, Mary, what do you think? Did, did you not see the video? I was screen sharing. I know, but we couldn't hear it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I don't know why that would be. I wasn't muted and I can hear it. You can try again, though. It? In, uh, in Zoom to share the sound. Oh, in Zoom it says share the sound where? Before you screen share. Oh. I hadn't seen this before. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I'll start over. Ambassador, are you there? I'm listening, Newland. It's a little noisy here. My plot to overthrow the elected president is working beautifully. I want our neo-Nazi friend on the outside help us install a U.S. puppet on the inside. Yeah, neo-Nazis should be consulted four times a week until our guys are. I'm not sure the European Union will go along with every detail of your plot. The EU. Wait, did you say? I said I want a coup. I want to expand NATO up to Russia's neck. I want the US to rule the world. So let's send more weapons to those guys in Ukraine. The 
those are the guys I'm talking about. So, yes, it's gotten a lot of views, 10,000, over 10,000 on Twitter. Thank you, Mary, for sharing that. And, uh, oh. you know, she's going to be third in line behind Antony Blinken. He's the you know, head of the State Department and Wendy Sherman, who did negotiate the Iran deal with Robert Malley. Uh, so hopefully uh, her voice will not be so prominent, but we want to make sure we send that message out to Biden as well, that we don't approve of her. Uh, all in all, though, there are some good signs. You know, we took Mike Morell off the table, the torture defender. Flournoy, who was advocating multiple simultaneous large theater wars, uh, troop escalations in China. She's not going to be our defense secretary. Biden today said he was restoring uh, millions, I, I think 368 million, uh, if, if he's restoring it to pre-Trump levels of aid to the Palestinians. And one thing I forgot to mention during the Haynes hearing is that when she was asked about Saudi Arabia and Khashoggi by Ron Wyden, the Democratic Senator from, uh, from Oregon, uh, she said that she was going to release a report. I don't know if she's releasing it to the entire Senate or just to the committee, but she was going to release the CIA's report on the investigation into the Khashoggi murder. And uh, the word is that the conclusion of that report is that it was ordered by the Crown Prince. So I think that is important. It's yeah. important to advance our efforts to block further weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. And judging by the news reports tonight, Biden is certainly leaning in that direction. Mm -hmm. On that good news, That's I want to thank all of you for coming yeah. tonight. Yes, thank and thank you very much. sending the message. Thank you. To the White House. And we'll see you next week. Thank and thank my, thank my co host. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Can you mute yourself so we can all say goodbye to each other. That would be great. Yeah, and maybe Nighty like. Good night. Thank you. Good night. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Coteen, for organizing this wonderful conference. Okay. Also, if you, wanna, you. if you want to see it again, it's on my Facebook page, Marcy Winograd. And okay. in, a, in a day or two, we'll put it up on YouTube. And I will send out that link if you're in our Google group. If you want to be in our Google group and you're not, just send Mary an email, mary at codepink.org. Okay? Right. Mary. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. you. And we will be sure to save the chat this time. So <laughs> good. <laughs> Close this, Marcy. So we I'm can not closing anything. Thank you very much, Hanya. You did a great job. Yes, this is Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I must leave. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you, Marcy. Yes. Thank yeah, you, Marcy. The question hope tonight. to see you. We hope to see you on the future calls. Yes, yes. Great meeting. Uh, sign off now. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. <laughs> okay, so Mary, we're we're good on the chat. Yes. Great. Good night, everyone.